I advise you that question number nine has been withdrawn. And I call Judith Cochran. Thank you. Question number one, please. Thank the member for her question. <clears throat> the various culture nights which took place on 18 September this year across the north were delivered by a mixture of private organisations and local councils. My department through the Arts Council made funding, a funding contribution of £21,000 uh, £21, £600 to the Cathedral Quarter Trust for Culture Night in Belfast. At this stage, it's too early to make an assessment of Culture Night 2015 for Across the North, as definitive information is yet to be made available. But certainly from the, the groups uh, and the, the initial feedback, and indeed from what I see myself, the event in Belfast in particular was a huge success, which early estimates would indicate that some 65,000 people attended events across the north, but the, as I said, that's an early indication. The continued high attendance figures provide a convincing indicator of support for the local cultural scene right across, and certainly the sector's potential to contribute to the development of a diverse and dynamic culture. The Culture Nights are now an integral part of the wide range of cultural offerings supported by my department, such as Belfast Pride in July, Festivals of Food, Fools, the Cathedral Arts Festival, which does continue to attract significant numbers of both uh, sectors and participants right across. I call Judith Cochrane for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and um, I thank the Minister for her answer. And certainly, the feedback across the media and, and from those of us who attended the events, um, it, it was a very positive um, night. I'm just wondering, um, you know, did the Minister receive any correspondence um, around um, the potential lack of funding um, this year, or the reduced funding, and the impact it made? And will she therefore um, commit to um, continued funding in future years? Well, certainly. Um in terms of the numbers, I mean, as I said uh, in the primary answer, I mean, it is early indications, but I mean, 65,000 people in Belfast on the 18th alone is very, very impressive. I have received uh, a, a lot of correspondence from groups right across uh, arts and culture, particularly about funding. Uh, but, but a lot of it isn't just about funding cuts, it's also about the availability of funding in future years. Some sectors have got organised and are looking at uh, a, a certainly a collaboration between Belfast City Council and tourism as well to ensure sustainability for the future. But I do believe that certainly culture nights, and I know even the Belfast Chamber of Commerce, and it's the same for Chambers of Commerce for other towns and villages and cities across the north, do see the economic impact and do want this to continue, and I'm committed to ensure that, that happens. I call Basil McRae. Uh, Minister, could I just follow up on uh, Ms Cochrane's uh, question by asking about the funding for Culture uh, Night Belfast? Uh, the organisers tell me that it was only possible to put the show on because of funding from a large brewery. And, uh, I'm not sure that that's desirable. I just wonder, did we increase or decrease the funding for culture arts in Belfast? Well, certainly um, the Culture Night would have had its award already, and all the cultural festivals are encouraged to try and get additional sponsorship. Uh, Culture Night in Belfast was very lucky to receive that, uh, that sponsorship, and certainly I know, even through the work, I mean, a member, even f as a member of the CAL committee, will know the work of arts and business that, that does help pair off businesses and sponsorships with cultural uh, provision. But it is important that that sponsorship continues. Certainly I know, even from talking to others, that they're having great difficulty, and I do think it's a conversation that we need to have, particularly with the Daddy Minister and other ministers, to ensure that this, this uh, attraction actually does help the local businesses, it helps generate the economy, and it does provide opportunities for people to look at new ways and su provide security for funding cultural packages, which everybody claims to reap the benefits of. Moving on, I call Alex Maskey. Thank the member for his question. <clears throat> the, independent pan the independent project assessment review, the PAR report, was published on the 7th of August this year, and I intend to implement all 20 recommendations contained within the report in full. Immediately following receipt of the report, I set about implementing those recommendations that, for me, were deemed critical. 
In, in May, is now, has now been appointed as a new full-time dedicated senior responsible officer for the regional stadia programme, and he took up his post on 1 September. Good progress has also been made in implementing the second critical recommendation, and that is the appointment of an independent chair of the safety technical group, with an appointment expected uh, in late, later this month in early November. I call Alex Maskey. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that response? Could I ask the Minister uh, to comment on the fact that the PAR report states that a new plan and application uh, for Cape will take up to 12 months to prepare? Can I ask the Minister is he content with that particular time frame? Well, first of all, no, I'm not content with that particular time frame, but certainly the PAR team looked at the, the maximum uh, time that was allowed to implement the recommendations. Certainly, they they interviewed, I am aware, and I know even from the report, that they interviewed many people regarding the Caseman Park redevelopment and certainly interviewed the Ulster, Ulster Council and did take uh, recognition of the work that they had done thus far. However, I think they have been very generous in their estimation that it will take up to an additional 12 months. What I would hope, and I know it is the members' constituency, but indeed what I would hope is that for, very, very soon the Ulster Council bring forward their pre-consultation consultation in order to uh, equip people who will feed into a consultation and a, a new plan application. And I would imagine that will happen very soon. I call Sean Rogers. Speaker, we are very well aware of what the GAA has contributed to society right across this land. Could, could the Minister tell me what action is her department taking to ensure the GAA has the right facilities to safeguard the longevity of the sport in an ever-changing modern society? Well, I thank the member for his question. First of all, I don't think anybody can actually say that I have given, I have given the GA and particularly the Ulster Council my full support, even in very difficult times. I have to say some of the members' own colleagues who stood in picket lines for people outside say Kaysen Park opposing the redevelopment was very disappointing. But certainly I will not be found wanting in giving the Ulster Council the full support in order that the GA have facilities that are fit for purpose for the 21st century. I call Adrian Cochran Watson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister not agree that the project assessment review was fatally flawed, as it did not involve the sports grounds safety authority in a meaningful way about emergency exit planning for Casement Park? Well, I certainly do not agree that the, uh, the power report is fatally flawed at all. Um, uh, what I would say is that all people. All relevant bodies were part of the consultation that was done by the power team. Uh, the people in terms who are responsible for emergency exit need to bring forward emergency exit plans as part of consultation and certainly part of any new application for planning. That needs to happen. I imagine ongoing work along with the safety at Sports Grounds Authority and many other people will continue as that application is in process. I call Jerry Kelly. Thank the member for his question. My senior officials have recently approved an outline business case for the refurbishment of Belfast Central Library, subject to a number of final technical issues that are, need to be addressed. The business case was prepared by libraries uh, and assesses the capacity of Belfast Central Library in its current state to provide efficient and effective services for the people of the local area, Belfast as a whole, and the wider population. The, the business case also evaluates and cost options for much needed future development of the library. The preparation of the business case and the process of approval has involved lengthy and detailed considerations in order to take account of the scale and complexity of the Belfast Central Library project. As part of the evaluation process, a, a casework committee chaired by my permanent secretary was established in July this year and certainly it will review the documentation and look at the work on addressing the issues arising from the, fin the final case work. My officials have just received a revised business case from libraries and expect to complete their review of this in, within the coming days. I call Jerry Kelly for supplementary. We guess uh, less than our hand Friar Guji Shaw. I thank the Minister for uh, her answer up till now. Uh, could you give us any idea of the, the, that there might be scope for uh, sharing services with the uh, local community and indeed the university, which is in the same area? I understand this is uh, not just built heritage, there's a long history here, but uh, it, it's used uh, by the community once it's uh, 
the, the work is done is very important? Well, the short answer is yes. I mean, Belfast Central Library currently have a good working relationship with a lot of the groups in the community, but they themselves, and indeed libraries right across the board, have exploited and certainly would encourage every opportunity to have greater links within the community, particularly within the community and voluntary sector. It is uh, a plus that the uh, Ulster University um, and York Road are expanding and certainly there will be an increase of students using that facility. I would imagine that the Belfast Central Library and indeed the university will try and offer uh, you know, additional support for students, but certainly in the first instance the work the community and voluntary sector will continue and if not increase and I would hope the same for the students uh, of all ages using university. I call Alden McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her previous answer. Could I, could I ask the Minister, uh, first of all, could I say that Belfast Central Library is the jewel in the crown as far as libraries are concerned here in Northern Ireland, and could I support the Minister in terms of her business case and the progress that's being made? But could the Minister estimate, given the fact that the business case is now almost complete, whenever this project can get off the ground and we would see completion? Well, certainly in terms of the technical bureaucratic processes, um, we're actually at the, the end of those. But I, I'm glad I actually took my time over this programme because even the estimate savings of a revised business case and a revised business plan looks at almost seven £7 million. Pounds. Now, that's looking at the development of the central library and its current footprint. Uh, you know, original estimate estimates looked at maybe extending it but certainly the work that's been done has actually proven not only can it be done on its current footprint which is the preferred option for the library but certainly it will receive uh, it will see a reduction in the original estimates and uh, you know like my colleague Jerry Kelly and indeed uh, Alvin McGuinness it is important that Belfast Central Library is redeveloped because it is probably one of the biggest uh, you know uh, landscapes in, in the city that definitely needs some tender loving care and certainly it has a great future in, in the, the city of Belfast. Could I ask all members to make sure they're, they're projecting their voice towards the microphone so that Hansard can, can pick it up. Nicole Ross Hussey. Did the Minister advise uh, if she's considered refurbishment of any other libraries within the Belfast area? I heard you mention briefly the, the, the business plan. Does that include other Belfast libraries as part of that? Did it look at that? Uh, this is just for Belfast Central Library. I mean, other libraries that have, have been refurbished within the Belfast area. I mean, the member may be aware of one recently opened in the Lisburn Road, and you know, certainly I've seen the Falls and Shankill libraries uh, that, that also received refurbishment. I've also seen the White Rock Library. I know of other libraries that, that have received small amounts of investment that have made a big difference in terms of its users. Far more pleasant circumstances and surroundings for people to visit the library. And, I think with the introduction of free Wi-Fi, it's certainly seen an increase in its numbers. And I would encourage everyone, if they're not already, to sign up to their local library, because it's when we get additional members, it actually helps sustain and maintain the libraries for the future. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question four, Minister. I thank the member for a question. The majority of positions on the boards of my department's arms and bodies are not uh, remunerated. However, there are travel and subsistence expenses payable. Some positions, uh, including the chair of the boards of the Arts Council, Forest Nagilga, libraries, museums, NI Screen, Sport NI and the Ulster Scots Agency, the vice chair positions of the boards of the Arts Council, Forest Nagilga, libraries, Screen, Sport NI and the Ulster Scots Agency, and board members positions on the boards of Forest Nagilga, libraries and the Ulster Scots um, are. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, uh, Minister. I'm sure you will join with me in paying tribute to the many men and women who do give voluntarily and of their time. And even if some are remunerated quite often, it doesn't recognise the amount of effort that they put into the organisations. But, Minister, in relation to the Board of Sport NI, could you give us any update in relation to the position of chairperson? Well, the, the chairperson of Sport NI didn't resign um, and he's still in, in post and he's doing a wonderful job um, and, and I fully uh, agree with the members comments in terms of I mean some of these expenses do cover uh, things like subsistence and travel 
that when it comes to the chairs and vice chairs, the additional responsibility they have actually go well above and beyond, I suppose, what many have signed up to. But the chair of Sport and I is still there, as is the vice chair, and both are doing an excellent job. I call Sean Lynch. I'll get to the last can call you. Can I ask the Minister to explain what steps our department is taking to improve the diversity of the boards of ALBs? Well, this, is, this question and this um, keeps coming up in terms of the diversity, and I certainly just want to put on record my commitment to ensure that we not only maintain but increase diversity on boards of public bodies, and I can only speak for that in my department, but certainly looking at representation of women and people with disabilities and people from ethnic minorities. Uh, we, I want to uh, and have went some way to ensure that as many people from as many backgrounds as possible can apply. Government departments are working together. Uh, the member will be glad to hear on this issue to ensure that there is a more effective uh, approach. And certainly, um, in, in relation to the ECAL, some of the competitions have included uh, contact with representative bodies such as Disability Action, uh, NICFA, the Rural Community Network, and Women in Business, to ensure that we have a greater diversity of people on our boards. <coughs> Moving on, I call Jim Allister. Question five. Thank the member for his question. Athletes from the north of Ireland are already able to compete for Team GB in a range of sports such as rowing, athletics and cycling. Responsibility for selecting athletes to compete at international competitions, including Team GB at the Olympic and Paralympic Games and Commonwealth Games, rests with the sports governing bodies and the council responsible for sending the local team to competitions such as the Olympic and Paralympic Games committees and the Commonwealth Games Council. With regard to the recognition of sport governing bodies, this is a matter for the sport itself and indeed for Sport NI, which operates a joint policy on governing body recognition with the sports councils in England, Scotland and Wales. The aim of the recognition process is to identify a single league governing body structure which governs the sport, for example, in England, Scotland and Wales, or in the case of the North, at Ulster or, or indeed across the island of Ireland. This policy is aligned to international best practice and was designed to help promote good relations within sport and foster social inclusion. Call Jim Alistair for supplementary. I note that for the first time the Minister dodges, not for the first time, she dodges the question. She refers to rowers being able to compete, for example, for Team GB, but only if they affiliate and live and operate in the, in the mainland of GB. If they want to compete as an athlete from here, then the minister continues to barricade their route by, and there is no pathway the for them question, to compete please. for Team GB if they want to be affiliated question, and operate please. here. Will the minister not address that inequity and allow those athletes to express their Britishness, which they are supposed to be able to do? Well, first of all, under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, anyone can, who identifies themselves as either Irish or British can do so. As I said in the primary answer, and I have repeated this to the member, so I know he understands the question, he just doesn't like the answer. It is a matter for the governing body. So uh, I have made it easier for people to compete. I have supported athletes, regardless of what identity they choose to identify, or, or, or even regardless of the team that they want to compete for, they've been given my full support. And I would encourage a member to get behind the athletes and stop, stop this ridiculous nonsense of sectarianising sport and bringing issues in that actually don't, Order. That don't, don't involve what athletes need to do. I call Dominic Bradley. I'll ask you to 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 Kajemer Bakor Eid Hien Agru Agus Gan Gan and Realtis Ave Korishach Erin Kartchen. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I would like to ask the Minister, does she agree with me that uh, it, it is the right of the governing bodies 
of sports to decide how they should best organise themselves, and that it is not the role of the government to interfere in that organisation. Well, India, I'm not going I, I completely agree with you, and I know the member heard the response I gave to Mr. Allister. I have continually repeated the case that it is. You know, in the instance, the, the, the responsibility rests with the governing body. It, it then, uh, for us as political representatives, certainly as governments, we should not be involved in creating impediments or barriers to prevent athletes competing for whatever team they wish to do so. In fact, it's our duty to support athletes regardless of what team or what nationality they wish to compete in. Moving on, I call Bronwyn McGahan. Question six. I thank the member for her question. My department leads on one of the seven headline actions from across the Executives Together Built United Community Strategy, namely the development of a cross-community youth sports programme. The principal focus of the sports programme is to enhance good relations through the transformative power of sport and creative activity. And in line with TBUC, the sports programme will need to have a rural dimension. This recognises that, inter that interfaces are not only physical bars, but also can lead to less visible social, economic and cultural bars that do impact on rural communities. The cross-community youth sports programme, is, if it is to be successful, it must uh, look at improving good relations and it also must take into account particular challenges faced by rural communities. So it is my intention to run a pilot programme in a rural area very soon. I will set out where this pilot will take place, and I will do so within the coming weeks. I call Bronwyn McGann for supplementary. Gurumi I thank the Minister for her response. Does, does the Minister envisage there to be any potential to include cycling as part of the T-Box Sports programme in a rural area? Well, certainly cycling is one of the sports that have been used as an example of, um, particularly, I mean, there was, uh, there was events in Dunloy. Uh, and other uh, parts, and I mean, we only had to look at the, the spectacle of the Giro d'Italia to see that there certainly is a, a big interest in cycling. And I know that even some of the sports clubs uh, that do have a very strong cross-community uh, participation, and the work that those clubs do um, across the board, including cycling, actually help children and young people, in particular, in areas that face challenges and actually face. Um, certain ongoing difficulties themselves. So I certainly would say cycling has been one of the sports that could be used as part of the pilot scheme to introduce TBOC into a rural community. Call Neil Somerville. Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Um, I wonder is the Minister aware of Clocker Valley Rugby Football Club and the fantastic work they do to promote uh, community relations? Could I at this stage declare an interest as being a member of the club? And what financial assistance is available to all sporting clubs within our constituency to help build a united community? Well, certainly um, the Clocher Valley Rugby Club and many others uh, will be aware of the recent, albeit a close in July, but certainly strat one of the sports NI capital investment programme. As well as that, there are sports lottery uh, programmes, and certainly looking at small to medium-sized grants. But certainly, there are opportunities through Sports NI's capital investment programme for your club uh, and many other clubs, particularly in rural communities. And certainly, even the work of the new councils in conjunction with Sport NI, in my opinion, thus far, has actually helped bring more information and maybe a better collaboration with some of the clubs to try and get a, an investment that they all can share. I call John Dallet. I thank the, the Minister for her answer. And given that we are still a long way from the ultimate goal of being a united community, I would welcome the Minister to outline the benefits of the programme together building a united community. Well, I am happy to do that. I mean, the member will know in his own constituency through Coleraine, the facility that we invested there. And, I mean, that in itself is an example that groups and areas and councils were coming together in the principles of uh, TPOC well before the, the, the fund investment hit the ground, but certainly it is welcomed. In Belfast, the pilot scheme is run in between two areas, two deprived areas in Belfast, West Belfast and South Belfast. 
I already knew even before the evaluation report was completed that it was a success. I met with some of the children young people, their youth leaders and indeed some of their parents, all of which said that this type of work needs to be not only continued but investment needs to be increased. Because when we look after children and we keep them safe, but when we keep them fit and healthy and well, it actually we're investing in the future of those kids and in the future of those communities. Moving on, I call Stuart Dixon. Question number seven, Mr. Speaker. Thank the member for his question. As, as Stuart, the member is aware, nine members of the Board of Sport and I resigned in July this year. I have commissioned an open competition to appoint up to five new members to the board. It was advertised in the local press on the 10th and 11th September, with a closing date of the 5th of October. The competition has been taken forward in accordance with the Commissioner for Public Appointments, Code of Practice for Ministerial and Public Appointments, and I expect these new appointments to be made in December. In the meantime, I have acted to ensure that the board continues to operate effectively. And following the circular I sent seeking volunteers throughout the civil service, I can confirm that three civil servants have been co-opted to provide advice and support to remaining board members. The volunteers will also provide additional support by sitting on a number of committees, including the Audit and Risk Management Committees. This is an interim measure, and the co-opted senior civil servants are not board members and do, ha do not have full voting rights. Dixon for supplementary. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Minister, for the answer. Minister, to lose part of a board might be described as unfortunate. To lose it again would be a disaster. What steps are you taking to ensure that the new board that you appoint will not resign again? Well, I am still at a loss as to why the nine members res resigned. I actually offered to meet them to find out, to ascertain why their reasons for it. I, one of them actually accepted the offer. Um, and I have spoken to others who have spoken to others who have spoken to others, but rather than relying on fifth and sixth hand information, the point is this, that I, when I was presented with a problem and a challenge, I acted immediately. Um, it is an interim measure that I have uh, co-opted members of the senior civil service onto the board, but in fairness to the five remaining members, they need support and they need support from us all. Um, so these uh, temporary measures, and I thank the, the, the members who came forward, but these temporary measures are only in place until the appointees, the remaining appointees are made. And I would hope that then we go through uh, exercises, information, discussions, meetings to ensure not only do people feel that they're supported, but certainly they, they understand their roles. But I am really encouraged at the amount of response and the amount of interest there was because people still feel very loyal to sport and I and indeed sport. I call Jim Allister. Minister, update us on the position of Chief Executive of Sport and I. Uh, there's presently an acting Chief Executive. Is that the situation to continue, or is there a recruitment process? Uh, and uh, in respect of the former Chief Executive, are there outstanding matters there still to be attended to? Um, well, certainly the, it's inappropriate, the member will be aware of this, it's inappropriate to comment on the uh, Chief Executive um, because that process is still underway in terms of the grievance. The interim chief executive will be there until the outcome of the grievance procedure has been completed. Uh, and I would certainly hope that once that's completed, we can move forward. But in the, as in the interim, I have acted very decisively to ensure that there is leadership given at Sport and I, both at an executive level. I call Ross Hussey. Question eight, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank the member for his question. In 2013-14, my department provided £50,000 of funding to the Nerve Centre to develop the Creative Centre's online platform, which provides a suite of online resources relating to the decade of centenaries. This was followed by a further £50,000 in 2014-15. I was also pleased to provide museums with funding of £127,000 in order to open a new modern history gallery which addresses the decade of centenaries, including the First World War. It was open to the public in November of last year. My department also provided museums with £50,000 for its programme to develop digital resources regarding exploring the decade of centenaries. And for the period of 13 to 15, the Arts Council also provided grants of over £33,000 to organisations, including £6,000 to the Somme Association on Reflections 
uh, to the Irish soldier on the Somme and £20,000 to DD Dance on Alternative Energies First World War Project and over £7,500 to Rathcool Friends of the Somme. My department is providing £30,000 in this financial year in the run-up to the anniversary of the Battle of the Somme to support the Somme Centre in delivering its plans also. The time for a list of questions is now up. And so we will now move on to topical questions. And I call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, of course, there's another big centenary celebration next year, Minister, and it's that of the Easter Rising. Perhaps you could outline uh, what budget your department has set aside to celebrate that event? Well, certainly I would anticipate that the budgets are uh, they're of equal uh, funding. Uh, and in addition to that, um, I'm happy to say that certainly other members of the DECAL family, including libraries and PRONI, um, have been very proactive uh, in terms of all the decade of centenaries. And I would anticipate that that same energy and that same commitment is given to the uh, commemoration of the 1916 Rising. I call Dolores Kelly for supplementary. Uh, thank you. Minister, could you uh, outline whether or not you have had any further discussions with the Irish Government in relation to uh, cross-border uh, cooperation in relation to the centenary celebrations? I certainly have. And, uh, I mean, even the, the commemoration into the famine uh, last week, I think, was done very uh, sensitively. Uh, it was done in, in a, a, an approach, certainly with organisers around the National Famine Commemoration, and certainly credit to Newry and Warren Council um, for their participation and the commitment that they give. I would envisage, and certainly I would expect, that the same commitment is given to not only 1916, the Easter Rising, certainly all commemorations are after. And I call Judith Cotton. Thank you. Um, I'm sure many of us across the chamber have been uh, following Ireland's ongoing success in the Rugby World Cup. Does the Minister agree that having the competition so close to home increases the interest um, in the sport? And is she um, supportive of ensuring uh, that the Casement Park development progresses in a timely manner so as to be included as a venue for the 2023 World Cup bid? Well, certainly. Um, I mean, the, the, World, the Rugby World Cup 2023 bid has been the focus of a lot of attention. It is important that Case and Park is redeveloped for that. Um, and certainly we have been in discussions with Irish Rugby and indeed with the Ulster Council, the GAA, along with colleagues and Daddy and many others. Um, so I mean we are really recommit recommitted to ensure not only is the stadium programme delivered, but all opportunities, not just for sport but for tourism as well, are exploited around the twenty twenty three bid. For and I thank the Minister for her answer. And give, given what she said, and given the level of public funding that has been allocated to um, redevelop the three uh, major stadia, um, I have today launched a consultation um, on a proposal to allow these three stadia to apply for a liquor licence. I am just wondering, does the Minister agree that we should be doing all we can to ensure that these stadia can maximise their potential? I absolutely do agree, and I think we also not only look at the physical redevelopment of this data, but also looking at rates as well, because particularly Ulster Rugby was hit very, very hard with rates, um, which does not stack up in terms of the original outline that we had in the business cases, but it's certainly something we are looking at, and they are looking at every opportunity to try and only generate income, which will not lessen the demand in the public purse, but look at opportunities, so to provide social opportunities for people to come when they're uh, looking at the, the, the sporting spectacle and the sporting event, and indeed for other opportunities as well. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, I wonder could you explain to the House why the Northern Ireland Audit Office took five and a half years to report on the failure of the North, Northern Ireland Events Company? Uh, the short answer is I have absolutely no idea. I mean, this was something that was, was not committed in my watch. I have had absolutely nothing to do with the report uh, because it was transferred over to Daddy due to uh, some of the issues that have been highlighted in the report. Um, but certainly, it is something that had it been on, under my uh, watch and on my desk, it would not have taken that long. I, call Leslie Cree. I thank the, the Minister for her answer. I wonder, then, uh, Minister, um, what lessons have been learned from this calamity and um, what steps have been taken to ensure that it, it cannot happen again? Well, first of all, the member will be aware that events have now been transferred over to Daddy. I'm not dodging the question. It's something that would be more appropriate to Daddy. But in terms of public scrutiny, uh, I mean, it's a question that Dolores Kelly has raised. It's about who you appoint to the board. Be clear about the responsibilities, the roles responsibilities you're asking people to do. It's about proper scrutiny from departments on the boards to ensure 
that the, the, the correct information, particularly for accounting officers, is adhered to. Where there are gaps and weaknesses, that they are met by the department. But I have to say, I mean, the, I don't think it's shameful reading uh, in terms of that, 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 that report. And, uh, and anybody who was involved in that, uh, or anybody who's involved in public boards or public bodies with departments, I'm sure have that report on top of their, on, on their desk because I think there's lessons to be learned for everybody, everybody in it. Uh, Conor Murphy has withdrew his name, so I now call Raymond McCartney. Uh, Mr. the last conclusion. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. The, the Minister will be aware of uh, the interest in, in, in Derry in relation to the development of the Brandywell Stadium, and I'm sure she's aware that this week there has been a, an advance in that in relation to uh, a letter of offer from the Social Investment Fund and run alongside the, the money provided by Derry City and Strabane Council. And I'm just wondering that the, the, the the Minister would be aware of how this is central to the Foyle Valley Kidway. Could she provide an update on the investment that her department has given to that particular project? Well, in fairness to Derry City, I think people in New Lodge are aware that the Brandywell is getting money, so far plenty is for that. Um, but certainly, uh, in terms of my contribution to Foyle Valley Gateway, I, I remember maybe aware of this, well, not me, he is aware of it. I'm certainly working very closely with Derry and Straban Council. Uh, we're finalising the, the business case for it to go forward for funding. Uh, so I'd anticipate that, that, that those finalisations or those final uh, bits of work that will be done very, very soon and hopefully we'll be able to progress uh, the project from there. Call Raymond McCartney. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, perhaps. Uh, and she has given an, an indication of the work that she has done with the Foyle Valley Gateway and the, the number of different interest groups involved in that. I'm just wondering, perhaps, would she accept an invitation to come to Derry to meet with the groups, and indeed, perhaps to meet with the football club as they develop the stadium? Yes, and yes. Happy to accept. Glackham, Glackham and Curry, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, Pat Sheehan has withdrew his name from to uh, topical questions, so I now call Sean Lynch. Can the Minister give an update on Sports and a Capital Programme? Well, certainly the first strand, as I think I uh, referred to, to, to another MLA for uh, asking another similar question, certainly the programme of the first strand closed in July. Um, I would anticipate by the end of this month that the, the review um, and the evaluation of those application forms, certainly people should know by the end of this month uh, of the status of their application. Coach John Lynch. Yeah, go on, Greg. This lesson are done for aggression. Um, Minister, I've met a number of GA clubs in County Fermanagh over recent times who have expressed an interest in this particular programme. And can Sports NA occasionally give updates to ensure people are informed? Am I well, certainly, I mean, that, in fairness to a member, that's one of the uh, concerns that I have picked up along the way. Uh, but in fairness, Sports NI have indicated recently to groups who have asked questions and raised concerns that they intend to make a decision on those applications for the closing date for July of this year. They'll be making them very soon. I would anticipate that they should be known uh, by the end of this month. Nicole Sam Gardner. Deputy Speaker, may I ask the Minister for an update on her bid in the June monitoring round for both capital and resource? Well, the member will be aware that the June monitoring round still has not been agreed. I call Sam Gardner for supplementary. Well, I'll, I'll fill you in on this one anyway. Because of the delay in declining in deciding the June monitoring round, how does the Minister intend to prioritise her spending for the rest of the year? Well, certainly, I don't need the member to fill me in on that. I'm more than aware of my own department and the budgets and the challenges and the constraints. I'm currently working through, along with my executive team within DECAL, uh, our budgets and certainly reprofiling budgets. And would hope that uh, when the executive next meets, we can sort out uh, certainly difficulties that all the departments are facing around money. Fran McCann is not in this place. I call Fergal McKinney. 
Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, and can I thank the Minister for answers thus far? I'm sure she now has the scarf and rattle bought uh, for the Euro qualifier on Thursday. Uh, but uh, in that context, what assurances can she give the House that uh, the work scheduled uh, around Windsor Park will be completed uh, sufficient for fans going forward? Well, certainly, I mean, the Windsor Park development is in his own constituency, and I'm sure he can also uh, confirm that the redevelopment of Windsor Park has happened. Uh, and it's, it's gone very well. Certainly fans, even when they went to the Games in June, were uh, uh, pleased uh, that the, their journey to and from Windsor Park wasn't that much impeded as expected. Traffic flowed well and there was no incidents to report. But certainly I'm, I'm pleased. Uh, I'm very happy with the, the process and certainly the speed at which re the redevelopment of Windsor is happening. I call Fergal McKinney for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's great to have ambition at the heart of these things, and clearly, when people see a project uh, uh, nearing completion or being completed, uh, they expect more. And the access issue, as you've raised, is is an important one. And are there any further discussions about how access in and around the city for Windsor Park uh, is going to be catered for? Well, certainly, I know that the IFA work very, very closely with the PSNI. And it isn't just around traffic management, it's also the work very closely with the ambulance service and fire and rescue service as well, in, uh, in conjunction with Belfast City Council, who at the end of the day are the statutory authority in terms of safety certificates. All of that is based on traffic management plans. Uh, the safety certificate isn't just about the capacity of games, it's all about how people get to games and go from games. So I'm content with the arrangements that they've done thus far. And in fairness, they're always looking for ways to improve it. If there are hiccups, certainly either going to or from a game, they very quickly learn the lessons for the next opportunity. And I think residents have appreciated that quick response. And that is the end of topical questions to the Minister. And as the next period of questions does not begin until 2.45, I suggest that the House take its ease until then.